Sorry about that. I'm going to have to do the old school this time with the uh, wired uh, attachment here. Well, thank you very much for uh, attending this. Uh, my goal here today is to introduce the logistical issues and safety concerns related to pediatric anesthesia with the goal uh, during uh, pediatric gamma knife uh, uh, stereotactic radio surgery to optimize uh, a safe, repetitive environment for us to um, have these going. Um, first off, I have nothing to disclose with this lecture. Uh, so at the completion of the lecture, I'm, I'm not going to teach you all the ins and outs of anesthesia, but uh, the goal, especially for uh, new programs, is to introduce the, the logistical issues that need to be considered uh, for successful repetitive uh, procedures such as this. Uh, so we're going to identify the key principles in providing anesthesia for gamma knife treatment. We will discuss and consider the, the various phases of anesthesia for, uh, as they relate to the various phases of gamma knife um, intervention. The goal being to organize the anesthesia team and the um, stereotactic rate of surgery environment in a way to provide safe planned anesthetics for this risky pediatric population. And then lastly, to identify and appreciate potential risks of anesthesia and identify systems-based processes uh, to optimize patient safety. So uh, just an overall general um, key principles of gamma knife anesthesia. So um, the goal being to prepare um, multiple remote non-operating room anesthetizing locations. That includes uh, anesthesia machines, uh, a, a pediatric specific anesthesia equipment, um, and immediate access to um, anesthetic as well as emergency drugs. The goal being to prepare each uh, clinical environment uh, for both ferromagnetic and radiation, and also to, uh, to ensure adequate communication between sites uh, to ensure uh, workspace and equipment availability at all times. Um, one key principle is patient optimization prior to the anesthesia induction. Now, obviously, with the goal being to minimize any complication during this potentially day-long uh, day, uh, day anesthetic. So um, just in brief, the appropriate MPO status is essential. Uh, um, any potential recent illnesses must be optimized and ensured to um, maximize safety, uh, especially after the procedure. And then optimal consent uh, for these procedures to be done under, under anesthesia. Um, the pre-existing conditions that may be considered uh, can include um, antiemetics, bronchodilators, uh, antihypertensive antiepileptics, uh, anticoagulants, antibiotics, and analgesics prior to induction. Uh, a lot of these patients may have concomitant issues related to chemotherapy, such as uh, chemo-induced nausea and vomiting, other options uh, or things such as uh, risks for positioning for a day-long anesthetic all need to be put into consideration. Um, the intraoperative goals can be somewhat challenging at times. Uh, those include to ensure adequate depth throughout the entirety of the procedure that includes transport as well as ensure full anesthetic at every single location. Uh, and that may include all the way through the post-operative phase if uh, situations such as flap time for um, uh, vena, uh, vascular uh, hemostasis uh, if groin access, for example, uh, was obtained for an angiography. Uh, secondly, the, uh, the goals being to maintain airway patency normothermia, which can sometimes be challenging in cold and um, radiographic environments, hydration, hemodebic stability, safety with positioning and transport of the patient, as well as adequate analgesia and sedation. Most importantly, emergency protocols need to be uh, rehearsed and practiced in simulated environments to ensure immediate um, uh, addressing of, of, of potential emergencies if they do persist. The phases of, uh, for, of anesthesia for gamma knife firstly include the pre-procedure. This is where we optimize the safety and ensure that um, everything has been done to um, ensure safety throughout the day. That includes the history and physical, consent, final patient verification readiness, uh, review of systems, intake bottles, and uh, pre-medication. So just in this population, pre-medications are quite often uh, frequent for many patients uh, prior to anesthesia. The intra-procedure uh, phase uh, after timeouts includes patient monitoring uh, begins, 
and then the induction of anesthesia. So typically we have a room that is prepped for the induction of anesthesia. Uh, typically patients may either an, undergo anesthesia via mask or IV induction if a central venous catheter is indwelling, such as a PICC line or port. Um, otherwise, um, after mask induction, an IV can be placed. Now, it's very important to ensure patency of the IV as often the inter, uh, interphase uh, procedure times include IV anesthetics. So things such as infiltration of the IV can result in patient getting um, lights and potentially emerging from anesthesia. The airway manipulation is important, and, and you know, 100% uh, um, the uh, recommendation is to place an uh, endotracheal tube. As after the endotracheal tube is placed, we're going to place a mask on top of the patient. So the ability to, uh, to uh, direct uh, um, uh, procedures to the airway becomes drastically more difficult uh, in, in, in terms of timeliness as well. And then, um, obviously, maintenance of anesthesia requires op optimal access to medications at all points of the uh, uh, gaminized procedure. And then postoperatively, um, ongoing sedation may be required if hemostasis is required um, post-angiography. Uh, and then emergence of anesthesia can be associated with some complications, and so postoperative monitoring may be, uh, will be required after the end of the procedure. And then the discharge criteria um, will determine the disposition. Often at our location here at UT Southwestern, we discharge our patients home. So the optimization preoperatively is essential to allow for this disposition. Now, often these procedures are, may not be done in a pediatric institution, so the disposition can be logistically difficult and must be determined or at least discussed in advance, such as if uh, admission or ICU um, is, is required for the patient post-procedure. The preoperative uh, period, um, as I mentioned, uh, is to optimize patients' uh, comorbidities into a, a, in a fashion to safeguard safety throughout the intra- and post-operative phases. Um, things, uh, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, recent respiratory illnesses, failed MPO status, late patient arrival, uncontrolled medical conditions such as nausea, vomiting, respiratory symptoms such as uncontrolled asthma, um, uncontrolled hypertension, and renal dysfunction can all place uh, increased risks uh, during the anesthetic period or post-operative period. System-related issues include a flowchart of anesthetizing locations, as often we must transport the patient maybe not only on the same floor, but across the hospital, uh, across various floors, uh, and any obstructions can uh, relate to potential uh, safety issues and or uh, issues uh, with uh, postponing the procedure uh, or, or delaying um, a, a particular phase of the uh, gaminized procedure. Pediatric specific anesthesia supplies should be checked and available at each site, as well as tech support. Um, typically, we have a pediatric PALS certified nurse that are our uh, assistant, um, as well as potentially a, fel a pediatric anesthesia fellow uh, for educational purposes that um, uh, assist us during these procedures. So the personnel um, involved um, for the, from an anesthetic perspective include pediatric anesthesiologist, the pediatric nurse, uh, which should be PALS certified uh, with the idea of having an immediate helper in cases of a emergency, uh, and the anesthesia technician, which are um, your uh, helper for um, equipment, medications, or any other logistical issues during the transport or uh, intraoperative phases. Um, the radiation oncologist, radiation technologist, physicist, neurosurgeon, and their interventionalist will also be available at those various areas of treatment. Um, the intraoperative period, um, as I discussed earlier with induction, the intubation is essential um, to ensure a secure airway throughout the entire day. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, normothermia, hemodynamic stability, and patient positioning are key, especially on, under general anesthesia. Clear communication and a coordinated effort for all patient transfers and positioning are essential. The, as I'll show you in the following slides, the head frame can be quite heavy um, in, in a stereotactic way, to, and can be a, and, um, due to this heavy frame on a small body, there could be uh, chances for either positioning-related issues 
or even injuries to the uh, cervical or um, cervical spine, skin, or peripheral nerves. System-related issues in this phase include the availability and access to anesthetizing medications and equipment throughout. Um, specific equipment that are pediatric specific. Um, we have, for example, children ranging from under a year to, uh, uh, as Dr. Weprin mentioned, over uh, the into the adult-related um, uh, ages. And so having a variety of, of sizes available for a particular patient are essential. And also the availability of a pediatric specific emergency crash cart uh, should be available uh, throughout that period as well. So uh, as was mentioned, the, the head frame placement um, uh, it typically happens right after the induction of the anesthesia and intubation. As we show here, uh, this is a small patient that is undergoing head uh, frame placement and um, uh, and uh, and uh, special torque wrenches are ensured to uh, uh, to minimize uh, trauma to the uh, cranium, um, and we use a special ramp to um, you know uh, get to the backside of the patient's head while they're under anesthesia. As we see that the frame is heavy, we must have support on the back to min uh, minimize any significant traction on the spine, um, and uh, the endotracheal tube uh, is in the corner here. Um, and that shows um, that shows um, the uh, circuit, uh, which I'll show you in the next slide, uh, attached to the anesthesia machine. So, um, so again, clear in this phase, clear emphasis is essential um, because um, any potential um, drop or anything on the patient could potentially relate to injury. The planning phase and preparation for transport. So. There are some phases of the anesthetic period we are, where we are waiting and the patient remains anesthetized. During this time, patients can get cold or hypothermic or even become hemodynamically unstable. So it's in, important to ensure uh, not only adequate um, continuous sedation, but also um, uh, supportive care in, 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 uh, if, if required. So IV fluids throughout the day, uh, the need for potentially for a Foley catheter may be necessary if the, if the treatment is planned for a long time. Uh, recently, we uh, uh, performed a general anesthetic on a 21-year-old, a 20-year-old uh, male, which included uh, the need for SEDs and potentially uh, post uh, pre, uh, post-operative disposition planning as well for that patient. Um, a, another particular pearl in the situation, as you can see, the frame goes over the front of the face. So, being a, if the endotracheal tube were to be um, accidentally, um, a patient were to be accidentally extubated. Um, as I will show later on uh, patient safety data, there are um, potential for major complications of this period, uh, extreme hypoxemia um, and, and potential um, emergencies can happen if, if the endotracheal tube is accidentally pulled or um, an ex incidental exudation has happened. So the hardware uh, for the frame removal must accompany the patient at all times so that we can uh, emergently remove the frame if absolutely necessary. Um, moreover, also having backup air equipment, uh, emergency drugs, and anesthetizing equipment, adequate oxygen supplies, and, and are all important throughout each, each phase. Um, so we transport the patients uh, from the uh, induction room, um, and then we'll, we'll uh, basically travel with the patient under anesthesia to the various locations that are required, such as angiography, CT, and MRI, as well as the final gamma knife treatment room. So uh, timeout is essential at each phase and, and ensure that we have everything um, optimal for patient safety. For example, the hardware um, or um, any other uh, metallic equipment must be ensured to be away from the patient and outside of zone four prior to an MRI. Um, and um, you know, uh, any potential uh, ferromagnetic is things such as even a, a stethoscope or a pen can become a missile and potentially harm the staff or and the patient. So that must be um, definitely uh, um, secured before the, the procedure begins. Um, and um, in, in terms of the machine and the maintenance of anesthesia, the MRI environment does create some logistical issues. So having ferro, um, MRI compatible equipment, laryngoscopes, um, or um, uh, the anesthesia machine itself must be planned before uh, the treatment period. And then, um, as is a pattern with a lot of these stereotypic procedures, remote monitoring of the patient will uh, continue to occur during the procedure. And I should show you here uh, at least two to three 
uh, pan zoom tilt uh, cameras will ensure that we um, are able to uh, adequately monitor the patient and or the monitor uh, for any potential um, risks going. So just as to show you, there, there is a blueprint uh, as in terms of, of us traveling around between various areas of the hospital, this becomes more logistically involved uh, in, in with a patient under anesthesia. The post-operative period may require continuation of anesthesia um, in, in the situation if groin access was obtained uh, for flat time and hemostasis prior to the patient discharge. Um, some potential um, um, side effects of the anesthetic that can happen include post-operative nausea and vomiting. And um, at that, with that being said, there is a risk for aspiration if that were to occur. So um, it is our, is the anesthesiologist um, uh, obligation to ensure that um, the extubation and emergence is done so in a safe manner to minimize that. Shivering, emergence delirium, and um, desaturation or hypoxemia for a variety of reasons um, from uh, breath holding, laryngospasm, uh, bronchospasm are, are all possible. Uh, and, and it's our uh, obligation to optimize that, uh, minimize that from happening. Uh, System-related issues do include the nursing. So um, for, especially at an adult institution, pediatric-specific nurses um, may be required to, for all the various issues related to um, the, the pre-, intra-, and post-operative care. And then finally, the final disposition should be discussed uh, beforehand, such as a, a potentially um, neurologically unstable patient, uh, which we uh, rarely would do for gamma knife radio surgery. However, if um, any potential complication were to happen, um, admission or intensive care uh, availability should be uh, discussed. And as I was discussed earlier, uh, the patient must meet this church criteria and um, that must be signed off by an anesthesiologist uh, and team prior to transport. Uh, to home by the parents or um, transport back to the pediatric institution for further care. So just a real brief overview of safety data in pediatric gamma knife. So currently, um, safety data for pediatric non-operating room anesthesia, or we call it NORA, uh, such as diagnostic or interventional radiology, endoscopy, cardiac catheterization, radiation oncology, and, um, and in including gamma knife, is quite limited. There's roughly a 0.01 to 3.5% incidence adverse, of adverse events from pediatric sedation reported in the radiation oncology literature. And those typically, most of the reports are from, major, uh, are from external beam radiotherapy. And airway complications appear to be the most common. Gamma knife specific anesthesia data is even more limited and subject to underreporting, such as, uh, as this procedure is, is not the most common, commonly done. The Wake Up Safe is, was established in the 2008 by the Society of Pediatric Anesthesia Quality Improvement uh, Initiative in conjunction with the American Society of Anesthesiologists. And it's a national registry of peri-anesthetic serious adverse events in pediatric patients. Uh, as, it, as to date, there are 34 national pediatric institutions involved and roughly about data from about 500,000 anesthetics are recorded every year. Um, the authors at Christensen et al. queried the Wake Up Safe Registry uh, from 2010 to 2018, and, of, and they noted uh, 3,379 um, adverse events and 3.3 million anesthetics. In, in the radiation oncology um, uh, uh, subgroup, there were noted to be six major adverse events, zero deaths luckily, but two CPR events and two ICU admissions. When you go back to the data, two key, um, two key um, uh, uh, causes were potentially looked at as being um, related to these events. One was the stereotactic mask. So in one case, a patient uh, undergoing stereotactic radio surgery suffered bronchospasm um, under anesthesia, inadvertent extubation, difficult ventilation and reintubation requiring emergent mass removal the patient got to the point of hypoxemia requiring CPR um, due to um, uh, asystole and eventually got a uh, return of circ uh, cir uh, circulation and um, ultimately required ICU admission. Uh, upon falling, uh, it seems that the patient uh, recovered well from that with no prolonged sequelae. Uh, the remote patient monitoring also becomes a potential confounder and, and it can become a serious safety issue. 
uh, there were three reported medication administration errors and the ring spasm event, which involved the mask and delayed recognition. And these were attributed to limitations of remote monitoring. So remote monitoring in this particular situation becomes key. Um, and in at least having at least two um, pan tilt zoom uh, um, cameras, if not three, would allow us to have adequate um, visualization of the patient uh, when they're in the treatment room. Uh, in terms of general anesthesia, most specifically kind of related to this um, uh, type of, 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 of case, uh, I'm going to go from the most common to the least common in terms of risks. So emergence delirium it may not be as common with gamma knife radiation. It's more commonly uh, associated with a prolonged uh, volatile anesthetics or the gas anesthetics. Um, those patients uh, can wake up with delirium. This is commonly um, self-limiting, but can be potentially traumatic, traumatizing to parents. So um, with the, um, uh, the use of propofol um, intravenous anesthesia for pretty much most of the period, given the fact that we need to co constantly move at the patient, this, this particular um, side effect is least common, or is not as common. Uh, reversal postoperative pulmonary complications are common with any anesthetic. Those can include laryngospasm, bronchospasm, hypoventilation, uh, and potentially even aspiration, which I mentioned lower as a risk. Um, postoperative nausea and vomiting can be associated with narcotics and or volatile agents, uh, also with prolonged anesthetics. Hyperthermia is a risk, um, especially in the smallest of children. Um, so ensuring um, either passive or active uh, warming, um, especially during the wait periods, um, are important. And a lot of times we're pushing patients into cold environments, uh, such as the MRI, um, due to the environment, required environment for those equipment. Procedure-related complications can include pain, hematoma from vascular access, conscious-induced nephritis, um, persistent postoperative complications, uh, cardiovascular complications can include hypotension and hypertension. As I mentioned before, aspiration can be a potential risk um, of, of the anesthetic. Uh, and I mentioned earlier, physician-related uh, injuries can be, um, can be possible. However, luckily we have not seen it yet at our institution, but things such as corneal abrasions, um, uh, just passive like wires and, and um, uh, cables that just rub against the eye. Skin injuries, um, whether um, from pressure injuries or um, injuries related to um, impact. Uh, burns um, that can be associated even with the MRI environment. Um, so having a, a patch or any type of metal touching the skin during the MRI uh, must be avoided. Ma magnetic related um, complications such as missile complications uh, from ferromagnetic uh, materials being introduced into the magnet. Falls, um, which can happen at any time, including patient transfer and nerve injury, um, which can happen secondary to uh, improper positioning of the patient. Uh, so it's our duty to, um, once a patient's under anesthesia, to optimize that to minimize any of these position-related injuries. Anaphylaxis is possible. Most commonly, um, agents include the uh, contrast for scanning. Um, anesthetic agents most commonly uh, associated with our um, muscle relaxants. So we do give muscle relaxants towards the beginning of the procedure and as well during the course of gamma knife procedure, especially with prior to um, increased levels of stimulation. So um, those are also, also possible. And, and, and uh, update, uh, muscle relaxants and antibiotics tend to be the most commonly seen anaphylactic um, ag um, related agents uh, under general anesthesia. And lastly, malignant hyperthermia. So this is a rare genetic uh, um, syndrome related to a particular receptor called the ryanidine receptor in the muscle cell. Um, it's a very uh, rare phenomenon that occurs in uh, one out of 30 to 50,000 general anesthetics. Um, and um, those can be associated with a variety of, of particular syndromes. This is extremely rare. Um, but should be uh, uh, um, assessed and, and, is oft, and is always assessed uh, from the anesthetic preoperative evaluation. So in this case, um, there are needs. So if, if volatile agents are used, a malignant hyperthermia cart should be in, uh, accessible to some point. Often in the, um, if th this was to occur close to an operating room, a malignant hyperthermia cart is always there. Um, but, but this should be checked beforehand as well.
So for review and discussion, um, there are some increased logistical um, issues and the potentials for complications whenever we introduce uh, the need for anesthesia for gamma knives. And so our duty is to optimize safety and make sure that this um, uh, obviously complications don't happen. So, um, so uh, as just a review, there are multiple remote non-operating room sites. Uh, the adequate preparation and availability at each site is essential, and that requires communication between each site prior to, to transport there. Uh, the understanding of safety principles in the magnetic and radioactive environments are essential. The patient, uh, to minimize complications, the patient's uh, optimization of their pre-existing medical conditions must be ensured prior to the start of the case. Uh, the perioperative anesthetic course uh, does include several important phases, the induction, um, the maintenance phase, and the emergency recovery phase, which I've discussed earlier. Anesthesia is not without morbidity and complications. So it's important for us to understand that and to understand that safety uh, will become more and more a priority in terms of looking at um, all the potentials for, for complications again, that can happen. So the availability of things such as difficult airway equipment, emergency medications, emergency equipment, and having a particular code response and a code team protocol are important. And this often becomes more complicated because um, in an adult hospital, pediatric codes may not be as um, uh, common for them, and as well, the, the availability of readily help may be a bit more difficult. So having a, um, a system where you have some simulation for these environments may be helpful. Um, so for those considering uh, uh, the start of a gamma knife site, the pediatric anesthesia cases may not be a common occurrence and are often performed in a non-pediatric environment. So in involvement or consultation of the pediatric anesthesia uh, department may be helpful to kind of uh, foresee these issues and to pre-plan and, and potentially uh, um, uh, uh, minimize issues that may be discovered uh, after the fact. Uh, considerations such as emergency electrical outlets, gas and vacuum outlets, um, uh, WAG um, or, or waste anesthesia gas outlets, um, data um, uh, um, uh, accessibility so we can uh, translate that to our uh, um, electronic medical record, um, uh, age and, 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 P and uh, specific equipment, um, and, think and emergency supplies such as a crash cart and a million hypothermic cart are important. There is a potential need for advanced air equipment in, in uh, such cases as a difficult airway. Uh, staff, members, staff members that may be working with us may not be familiar with the care of a pediatric patient, especially one under anesthesia. So it's important to have open communication between team members to ensure safety for everyone. And pediatric specialized RNs can help us with the, the, the process and more importantly be available for emergencies as well. Other anesthesia-specific gamma knife considerations include uh, anesthesia tech support uh, to ensure that there's a uh, pipeline for pediatric equipment uh, and emergency protocols that include pediatric-specific issues. Um, and so thus, uh, routine simulation um, it, it can be um, very helpful for everyone. Uh, and in essence, that's it. Um, um, thank you for, for listening, and I'm open for your questions.